Utah Jazz dominate the Oklahoma City Thunder in every way. Expect them to against a team of a bunch of Thunder players who you might have never heard of unless you're a total basketball junkie. But the Jazz did what they should. They've probably clinched themselves the number one offense in the NBA after this performance. And a lot of guys had really good nights. We're talking about it coming up on Postcast. I'm not entirely sure, Ron Boone, David Locke along with Ron Boone, but the Jazz offensive rating of a 145 tonight, I'm pretty certain is going to secure them the number one offense in the NBA this year. I, They were ahead by enough. You don't get anything for this. We're not going to hang a banner for number one offense in the NBA. But if you came into the night tonight, the Utah Jazz offense was the best in the NBA by a full point over the Hawks. We'll be up a little bit more. I actually think we might not have to score again. So, Pat just patted it. That's all. Yeah. Like, I, I actually think we could score, like, 50 points in each of the next two games and still be the number one offense in the NBA. Wow. Well, it does say something, even though you don't get an award for anything like that. It's just so that you have a, a potent offense, uh, considering, what, how many years you want to go back, five or less? where the Jazz were more of a defensive team and not so much of an offensive team. So that has um, worked. So I think if I remember correctly, back then there was number one in defense, but may, maybe 20th in offense, something like that. Right. Then they brought it down to. And you know what? I mean, in the recent years in this league, offense has won in the playoffs. If you go look at most playoff series, the team with a better offense has won most of those playoff series. Now we're going to have to figure out if we can stop people in the playoffs. And that, you know, teams have exposed how to move us. I was talking to the Thunders head coach, Mark Dagnall, before the game about, you know, hey, it's like we got to move Rudy. We, we understand that. Like teams have – and I thought he was really interesting about it, Ron. I was asking him if he thought the Jazz were like the most scouted team in the league. And he said, well, maybe for us it's like Jokic. He says, because really our scouting works in the manner that we start with the principal piece mm-hmm. and then we figure out how we're dealing with that and then we domino it down from there. And so he's like, hey, Harden for all those years – Jokic like we know exactly what we're trying to do there and then we domino it down what I actually think about that is like actually Rudy's probably our principal piece when you come to scout us it's just on the other side of the ball right and so you figure out the very first thing you do in your entire scouting report against the Jazz is how do we what do we do to make Rudy Gobert who he called a generational defensive player not alter the game and then you work the dominoes from there on how you're going to play what lineups you're going to use and everything like that and so in that sense, I think maybe that's why I keep saying I think we're like the most scouted team in the league is that Rudy's been a three-time defensive player of the year. He's the He is a general. He's one of the four or five greatest defensive players in the history of the game. If he wins a fourth one this year, he might be the greatest defensive player in the history of the game. Teams know that's the first thing they have to deal so, with. So that's interesting because, uh, it, it, as you mentioned, they start with Jokic and work their way down. But with, with the Jazz, they start defensively with Rudy Gobert. Well, he said, hey, you start with Donovan. We have, right. we know every way we're going right. to deal with Donovan. I think the equivalent is that you do that with Rudy defensively. Right. Okay. Which makes sense. And, you know, every coach has a different way of, of doing things. And usually it's the personnel that they have that, uh, that they try to put together to make it work. So uh, this one was in, you know, the Jazz did what they were supposed to. I, I thought they basically defended the scoreboard. Yeah. Right. Like mm-hmm. you're not going to ask a team to come out and play a huge amount of aggressive, you know, you know, whatever to the wall defense on a night like tonight. And if you kind of watch them, they defend the scoreboard. The game would get to five. They'd take it back to 12. Then eventually they wore them out, took it to 30 and just completely dominated the game. Um, fun one, though, for a few things in this ball game. Uh, you know, for example, like the first play of the game, Juancho Hernan Gomez gets an offensive rebound. Like yeah. the guy just knew exactly like, oh, he's going to get the start. That's his role. Um, in the ball game, Daniel House went four of seven from three. I mean, if he continues to shoot 45% from three, that is an incredible weapon for the Jazz. Career 35% shooter, but he is shooting 45% as a three-point shooter for the Utah Jazz. That seems like it's going to be hard for him to keep that up. That shot's not pure. The game speeds up in the playoffs. It seems harder, but, boy, he's been incredible. And you notice where they were coming from. Most of his three-point shots, opportunities anyway, have come from the corner. Uh, something that the Jazz work at. And because when they're driving to the basket, eyes out, very impressed with a couple of possessions there by Rudy Gobert, catching the basketball, turn, face the defense, and and look toward the three-point line. Rudy Gay did the same thing a couple of times. So that's impressive knowing that, you know, if you got guys like Boyan, who's probably one of the best we have that can shoot the three, that um, you, you can find them to shoot the three-point shot. The Jazz got up 
36 three-point shots tonight. Is that the most we've had in quite some time? Got I don't 36 think so. Threes. It doesn't seem like that many to me. You might be. You are usually right when you say something like that. But other than the fact that we had, uh, let me look. Give me one second, Ron Boone. Yeah. Let me go to the computer um, and see. I only have first half numbers up from the last few nights. I was looking. I was scanning to see how our first half play was recently because it feels like we've been starting better. We're the slowest pace of play team in the league in the first quarters. Yeah. And I thought we had gotten a little bit more aggressive and done some things more. So I was looking at that. Yeah. But I now have, I would have guessed, I would actually guess in overtime last night, we exceeded that number. Um, if nothing else, just because it's overtime. Well, I but, can find that. Um, Ron Boone has these things readily available. I do want to address, as we're looking that up, um, one of the questions that's on hand, I can't bring it up on the thing, but uh, I think it was Adam Bartolo is asking Ron, I think, in, what was our three total last night? We had 34 in regulation, so it had to be more than that. You're, you're yeah. probably right about that. So I think that. we've gotten up 40 a few times recently. We had 38 in overtime we had last night. 46 against the Warriors, 44 against the Lakers, 47 against Charlotte. So I think we've gotten some up. So I think this yeah. is a really interesting question. It's being because it's a narrative that's out there. Um, so Adam Bartolo is asking Will Quinn roll with a hot hand in the playoffs this year as opposed to a set rotation? It hasn't been something in his usual makeup. So that's a really interesting question for me, and I don't know where it comes from. Because a few things, like if you go back to the Houston series, he benched Derek Favors a few years ago and started Jay Crowder in that series. So he, he did exactly what you're saying there. Mm -hmm. And then I would I would ask the question, like, who in the years past has the roster had on it that wasn't getting playing time that you think should have been getting playing time in the playoffs? Or that should have been, didn't get enough. Like Joe Ingles, quite honestly, had terrible playoffs. Mm -hmm. Jordan Clarkson has not had good playoffs. So who were the players that you were playing instead? I, it, This narrative is hot out there that Quinn won't adjust. He won't change. Quinn won't. Quinn will not. This is true. Here, here's the truth. Quinn will not sacrifice one given game to offend a player and lose them in the locker room. If they're going to do what they did with Juancho Herman Gomez with Rudy Gay, it's going to be something where he talks to him, explains to him, tells him how he's going to use him moving forward, and not something where he sends him on some roller coaster and has him complaining in the corner of the locker room and costing him the locker room. Like, Quinn's very conscious of that. Right. And so you're right. In that sense, he's not willing to – like, pulling Royce O'Neal and playing Daniel House the other night had to, was a big deal like that. Right. And, and, and those are big deals. You lose locker rooms if you screw around with that. So – in that sense, but I don't know where this narrative is that Quinn has had other options to play over the years. Boy, you got me thinking here, and and you're you're probably dead like, right about like were we supposed to be playing Mia Oni, Elijah Hughes, right. and like Justin Fort, yeah. uh, like last year? Like I don't know who people are talking about in that. I don't either. I don't either. I mean that option. No, David, I, I really can't. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that, I, that's tough. I'd have to go back and look at the roster. I mean, Adam's see. basically saying he wants to know House versus Royce. Well, we've seen it already. Like, Well, we, we're finding we, out that Royce has been a little banged, banged up. up. Yeah. He's been banged up. And as you mentioned, you know, tired. Uh, he hadn't missed any games and, and uh, always defending how volume type offensive I mean, players. I, I've never dealt with this before, but I'll tell you what, if I was our medical staff or Quinn Snyder, I don't understand like loads and things like that. I literally would go to Royce O'Neal right now and be like, do you want to play next a week from Saturday when we play our first playoff game? Do you want to play against Phoenix? Do you want to play against Port? Like, what do you want? What right. does your body need? Because if you would like two weeks off, I think it's a good idea. Yeah. You have guarded the number one option every single night all year long, and you're clearly exhausted. Yeah. And you have been throughout your career, and we need you for the play. 